Oh, across. Okay, yeah. So let's declare together the words on the screen. If you can join in the bold words, I'll read the rest. So shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship, Worship the Lord with gladness. Come, Come before him with joy and songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We, we are, are his people, the sheep of his pasture. So let's stand and join to sing a wonderful hymn. Praise to the Lord the Almighty. <laughs>
please take a seat. Let me have my introduction to Ruth. Um, I'm a minister here at Trinity at Four, and uh, we're just thrilled to have you here with us today. And we've come now to our baptism. And um, in just a moment, I'm going to invite the parents and godparents um, to come up. And if any young people want to see what's going on, there's plenty of space to kind of sit down on the floor down here. So you're welcome to come up um, to the front and have a look, if you'd like, when we get to it as well. Okay, but first of all, I've got a question for a young person. Um, We have got here the water that we're going to perform baptism with. And I want you to tell me, what is, what, can anyone tell me what the link is between these three things? There's some wipes, there's some hand sanitizer gel, and there's some water from the baptism thing. Anyone tell me, what do you think these three have in common? What's the, yes, Nathan. They all clean things. Who has got sick and tired of having to use this over the last two years? My hands are still recovering, I think. And um, this is something that um, I should probably use much more um, at home um, myself. It's a kind of multi-purpose cleaning wipe. And here is some water. And of course, water is what... One of the things we use water for is for cleaning. Now, water, of course does nothing to clean us on the inside, but Jesus gave it to us as a picture of what he promises to do on the inside. Because when Jesus died on the cross, he said anyone who trusts in him can be clean from the sin on the inside of our hearts. Now, isn't that a wonderful promise? So, as we baptise Bobby and Livy in a few moments' time, the water is a picture of a wonderful work that we pray Jesus will do in each of their hearts as they come to trust in him. It's all about cleaning. Isn't that wonderful? Now, at that point, can I invite them, parents and godparents, to come up here? And there are going to be some words for all of us to join in with, up on the screen. Fantastic. If you guys come on up here and stand just to my my left. Well done. Well done, the Chambers family. Jesus said to his disciples, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Baptism is the sign of the new life that God gives to all who trust in him. People of God, will you welcome Bobby and Libby and help them put their trust in Christ and thereby find new life in him? With the help of God, we will. Parents and godparents, the church receives Bobby and Libby with joy. Today we are trusting God for their growth in faith. Will you pray for them, draw them by your example into the community of faith and walk with them in the way of Christ? With the help of God, we will. Today you speak for Bobby and Libby. Will you care for them and help them to take their place within the life and worship of Christ's church? With the help of God, we will. In baptism, God calls us out of darkness into his marvellous light. To follow Christ means dying to sin, and rising to new life with him. Therefore I ask, do you reject the devil and all rebellion against God? I reject reject the devil. Do you repent of the sins that separate us from God and neighbour? I repent of them. Do you turn to Christ as Saviour? I turn to Christ. Do you submit to Christ as Lord? I submit to Christ. I sign you the cross. That is the sign of Christ. Do not be ashamed to confess the faith of Christ crucified. Together, fight valiantly as a disciple of Christ against sin, the world and the devil and remain faithful to Christ to the end of your life. And so may Almighty God deliver you from the powers of darkness, restore in you the image of his glory 
and lead you in the light and obedience of Christ. You have brought Bobby and Libby to baptism. You must now declare before God and his church the Christian faith into which, he is, uh, into which they are to be baptised and in which you will help them both to grow. You must answer for yourselves and for Bobby and Libby. Do you believe and trust in God the Father who made the world? I believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in his son, Jesus Christ, who redeemed mankind? Do you believe and trust in his Holy Spirit who gives life to the people of God? This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Well done everyone. We come now to the baptism. So shall I grab, so Bobby, why don't I grab you first? Now do you want to move a tractor as well? Yeah? Well done. So, Bobby, Christopher, Eric Chambers, I baptise you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Olivia Gillian Chambers, I baptise you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Bobby and Livy, by one Spirit, we are all baptised into one body. We welcome you into the fellowship of faith. We are children of the same Heavenly Father. We welcome you. Shall we give them a big round of applause? And whilst you're up here, we have a Bible for each of the children, for Bobby and for Libby. That's the, that's the most important book you'll ever read, okay? or versions of it. This is a little children's one. And um, here are some certificates for you all as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And do please all go and grab your, grab your seats. That's it. Yes, Peter's coming. Coming headlong. Do stand.
basically a staycation. It's just up the road in, in Freeth and uh, 24 hours together um, as a church family. So can I just encourage uh, church family regulars, get yourself booked on for that and it will really help with our planning. Um, so uh, take the flyer home, put it somewhere where you won't forget about it and uh, if you could get yourselves booked in that would be um, a great help. And then just a final thing for regulars, it's our Trinity Together meeting this Tuesday. That's when we get together to pray for everything going on in our church family life. That's at Holy Trinity Church and we'd love to see you there, 8 o'clock um, this Tuesday. Um, and I think that's it for me by way of notice. Let me hand back to Ruth to explain what's happening with our, with our kids now. I'm not going to do an awful lot of explaining. I'm going to suggest you just get to the door, see Peter. Peter will point you in the right direction and your leaders will lead you out. Um, but let's, before they go, and let's just get them to the Lord and the leaders. Heavenly Father, you call the little children to yourself. And we long for those children of our families here to hear your word and to get to a place of personal knowledge of your love and your grace for them. So, Heavenly Father, be with them. Give them a fun time, Lord. Uh, give their teachers wisdom and encouragement as they teach them something new about you. So, Lord, be with them. Keep them safe. In Jesus' name, we ask this. Amen. And while the children are leaving, do take the opportunity to say hello to somebody sitting by you or around you. Today's reading is from the Gospel of Luke, which you'll find in your beautiful N Gospels. Um, so we are reading verses, ver sorry, chapter 15, verse 11 to 32, which you'll find at page 52 of your... I was given the wrong Bible. Sorry. What, what paper is it, Sam? My apologies. Um, so we are reading Gospel of Luke. Chapter 5, verses 1 to 11, which you will find at page 20. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowded around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats, 
left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the water, uh, put out into the deep water, and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled to the partners in another boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on the shore, left everything, and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Great, James, thank you. Sorry about miscommunication on that one. Come back next week, it'll be Luke chapter 15. And exactly the verse that James is about to, James is about to read. So, um... Good, well let's, uh, let's say a quick prayer and then we'll, um, we'll have a look at these, these, uh, these words together. So, loving Father, we, we thank you for the chance we have now. We live busy lives and yet we've got a, a short period of time just to be still, to think, to reflect. And we pray, Father, that you'd help us to, to make the most of the opportunity we have now. And we pray for just some clarity as to this question of how Jesus continues to be good news for us today. And whatever we currently think about that question, uh, we pray that you'd help us to perhaps make some, some personal steps forward on it um, today. And we ask that for Jesus' sake. Amen. Oh man, so um, three, three weeks and we've got an opportunity to, to kind of bore down into just a few short sections of this, this account of, of Luke. It was, it was written 30 or 40 years after the events of Jesus' life. Luke, the writer, is totally persuaded about Jesus. The question we have to ask is, what was it that persuaded him? And he's recorded the things that persuaded him about Jesus so that all these years later, we can have a little look ourselves and see what we think. So that, we've got three weeks. It's not very long. We can't possibly hope to cover everything that Luke has to say. But we are just going to bore down in three different areas. And today we're thinking about this question of purpose. Um, so here are two questions that we ask in life. Two questions we can ask in life. Um, there's the what questions and the why questions. So the, um, the what questions we ask all the time, don't they? Like, uh, what job should I do? Uh, what place should we live? What are we going to have for tea? What school should we send the kids to? Um, the, these are the, the kind of plans questions. They're all about plans and the routines of our life. The, 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 the what questions. What am I going to do in my retirement, perhaps? Those kind of questions. Um, if you wanted to sum it up, the what questions are about what am I going to do when I get out of bed today? Okay, that's a whole kind of area of questions that we ask in life. The why questions, well, as we know, they go a little bit deeper. Um, why am I doing my job? Yeah, maybe some of you are asking that at the moment. Why should we have kids? Maybe some of you are thinking, why did we have kids? <laughs> Sometimes I think that. Um, why should I retire? Um, why should I work? Why should I spend my money on that thing or, or this thing? And why questions go deeper. They're, they're not about plans. That's the what question. They're about purpose. And um, you don't have to follow the why questions very far before they start getting quite deep. You know... If the what questions might be summed up, what am I going to do when I get out of bed today? The why question is, why should I get out of bed today? What, what, fundamentally, why, are, why am I here? 
Um, I remember when I was at university, which is a little while ago now, um, having a conversation with a friend who was a, um, a, a, a Christian believer. And they said that they'd had a conversation with one of their, their course mates who didn't share their faith. And their course mate said, um, what is your meaning? Which is the kind of question you'd only ask at university when you're, when you're 19 years old. But that was the question. What is, you know, what is your meaning um, in, in, in life? What is, your, what is your reason for getting up each day? What is your reason in life? And um, this friend of mine said, well, you know, she, I'm, I'm a Christian believer. And they went on to explain how Jesus provides an ultimate reason for life. An ultimate purpose, if you like. And um, as his friend to- told, me, told me about the conversation, apparently their course mate said, you know, I, I envy you. I'm not sure if I believe that, but I need a reason. It's not enough simply to convert oxygen into energy anymore. Which, again, is the kind of thing you would only say if you were a university student. The rest of us are like... Oh my goodness me, like, you know, what are we going to have for tea today? Um, That's the thing though, isn't it? Like, if you think about it, what, these two questions, the what questions and the why questions, just think in your own head, what proportion of your life do you spend engaging with what questions? And what proportion of your life do you spend engaging with the why questions? I mean, I, I thought about this for myself, and I reckon it's probably, what, like 95% on the what questions? Maybe 5% if I'm generous on the why questions? Maybe when I was at university and I had time for that kind of speculation. But, of course, the, these questions, not the plans, but the purpose, the fundamental reason, they're important. Okay, why are you here in four generations' time? it is very likely you will be entirely forgotten, even by your family tree. Which is, you know, quite an arresting thing to think. What is the purpose of the short life that we all have? Now, as I've said, these good news services that we're having these next three three weeks, um, the central claim of this, this short account of Jesus' life is that Jesus is good news. That's the central claim of 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 Luke, the Gospel writer. Not just in a kind of generic way, but in a very specific way. He's he's good news for you specifically um, in whatever situation in life you you find yourself. And one of the ways in which Jesus is good news is that he offers a compelling answer to the ultimate why question. Okay, he offers a deep purpose that gives shape and coherence to all of the what's that we have to navigate um, in, in our lives. And we're going to kind of dig into that um, through the eyes of Simon, who we just read about in this, in this little account in Luke's Gospel. And, and we've got a picture of the lakeside scene. There's a picture of the Lake of Galilee up there. And um, it's early in the morning. The fishermen have come in from a fruitless night's fishing. They haven't caught a thing. They're there. They're cleaning their nets. And And gathered on the beach is a growing crowd of people around the the rabbi, Jesus, who is there teaching. Do you see verse 2? Verse 1, one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. Now this is, this is, I guess, one aspect of Jesus that most of us are very familiar with and probably quite happy to agree with. Jesus the teacher. So if anyone says, oh, you know, do you know anything about Jesus? They say, well, you know, I don't know much about Jesus, but I do know he was a religious teacher. And I do know that some of his teachings have you know, have quite an impact through, through life. And, and actually, those of us who are parents, we think, well, the teaching of Jesus, that's the kind of thing I do want my kids to sign up to, probably, one way, one way or another. So we're, we're familiar with Jesus the teacher. 
And that's what he's doing here. He is. He's, he's teaching. And perhaps that's how Simon at this stage saw Jesus as well. He's the religious rabbi. I'm the secular fisherman. He's, he's the guy who, who has the religious knowledge. He does the teaching. That's, that's who he is. He's a teacher. Which might explain his polite reluctance in what happens next. So, do you see verse 4? When Jesus had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for cash. And Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. I mean, you can see what he's thinking. He's saying, look, you're the teacher, I'm the fisherman. Okay? We, we've already had the night's fishing. There wasn't anything to be had. You're the teacher. How, how do you know anything about this? But out of, out of respect, Jesus is probably quite a well-known figure by now, he does what Jesus asks. And, of course, that's when it happens. Verse 6. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. And so they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. That's the point at which Simon, in spite of all of his better intentions, is confronted with, with a bigger reality. He's confronted with a, with a bigger reality. Put yourself in his shoes. How would you have responded if that happened to you? The boats are almost sinking. Fish are literally pouring into the nets. You've never seen anything like it in all of your, I don't know, 30 years on the lake as a fisherman. The thing is, this is, this is Simon's world. Okay, the lake, the fish, the boats, the tides, the currents. It's his world. And Jesus has stepped into that world with two things. Firstly, he steps in with, with authority. Simon has the, the kind of understanding of the lake. He has the experience, but it's very clear who has the authority, not just as a teacher commanding the attention of people, but it turns out he also commands the attention of the fish in the lake. Extraordinary authority. But another thing as well, abundance. Okay, Jesus takes what was empty and he makes it full. So Jesus, he, he's reached into Simon's world, he's spoken in a language that Simon understands, and the penny drops for Simon at that point. This is much more than just a religious teacher. And so you can see what he says, verse 8, and what he does. When Simon Peter saw this, he, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Okay, go away from me, Lord. That term, Lord, it's been used in Luke's Gospel in the kind of 20 pages so far, it's been used 32 times. 31 of those times, guess who it's referred to? Okay, the Lord God. And here, Simon refers to Jesus with that term. For him, it's obvious. Simon's life, like ours, has been... Predictable, normal, full of daily routines, okay, a life full of all those everyday kind of what questions that we have to navigate. But that day when Jesus sat in the boat with him, he was confronted with something much bigger than he'd ever encountered before, something that shattered the everyday routines of life. It was the last thing he was expecting but God had just stepped into his world. And friends, that's the, that's the central claim right at the heart of the, the Christian good news. 
that Luke has been persuaded of and that he is recording so that we might also engage with it. This staggering claim that with Jesus, God has stepped into our world. And the reason he's come is that, is that he might step into your world as well, just as he did with Simon Peter. And as Simon is confronted with this, this bigger reality, um, his view of himself shrinks, doesn't it? He says, get away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. Do you remember the classic film, Anchorman? And there's that great line um, uh, where he says, I'm kind of a big deal. Do you remember that one? I remember like quoting that with my schoolmates for like literally decades afterwards. I'm kind of a big deal. We, we can all be prone to thinking in that way, can't we? I'm kind of a big deal. But when confronted with Jesus, Simon sees the reality about himself will start clarity. He, he's sinful. He's prone to selfishness. He's prone to deceit and greed and unfaithfulness and full of contradictions and inconsistency. He talks a good game, but there are secrets. And isn't that like all of us to some extent? And so his instinct is go away. When, when, when something much bigger than him, he encounters something much bigger than himself, he realises just how small um, he really is. But wonderfully, God has stepped into our world not to crush us with a sense of our own inadequacy, but he stepped into our world to call us to himself. And that's the wonderful thing about this encounter that Simon has here with Jesus. You see, verse, verse 10, how, how does Jesus respond? Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. Don't be afraid. I've not come to crush you with a sense of your inadequacy. I've come to call you. Okay, he's not only confronted with a bigger reality, but on that day, he is called to a bigger purpose. As Jesus says here, from now on, you will fish for people. Now, here's, here's what's going on with, with what Jesus says there. On the, on the lake, Jesus demonstrated in the world of fish these things. Authority and an extraordinary abundance. He did that only as a picture of what he had come to do in the world of people. Authority and abundance. That's why he says to Simon, never mind fishing for fish. We've got a bigger job here. We're going to fish for people. Okay, what he did on the lake was just a picture of what he is going to do in the world of people. So Jesus isn't just God stepping into our world. He is God stepping into our world with a plan, okay, with a purpose for our world. He is coming with authority to bring abundance. That is his plan, his purpose for this world. Okay, so Jesus came with the authority to forgive sin, to pay for our moral debt. We couldn't pay for it ourselves, but when Jesus died on the cross, that's exactly what he did for us. Jesus came with authority to conquer death. He blasted through that impenetrable brick wall when he rose from the dead again. And, and Luke goes on to record this as a stark reality of history. Jesus came with the authority to call people like us to be part of this new reality that Jesus is opening up for us. A reality where we know the God who made us and we are brought back into relationship with him. Okay, so his authority, he came with authority to bring abundance. So Jesus, if you like, came to take the empty nets of our lives and fill them to bursting, to take the emptiness of sorrow and fill it with joy. The emptiness of guilt, he fills with forgiveness. The emptiness of anxiety, he fills with peace. The emptiness of a hopeless future. He fills with confident hope. 
Okay, Jesus, what he did on the lake is just a picture of what he had come to do in our world. He came with authority to bring abundance. A plan of salvation. And he called Simon and all of us to be part of that great plan and purpose. Because here's the thing, is we circle back to where we started. My life can only have lasting purpose if there is some purpose in this world. Okay, if this world, this universe, is ultimately meaningless, no matter how hard I search for personal meaning, I'm not going to find it. Not in an ultimate sense, anyway. But here's the good news. This world is not meaningless. There is a purpose, a great plan that God is working out. He has stepped into our world, and he is now... Unleash that good plan. And here's the thing, when your life fits with that plan, that's when you yourself find true, lasting, ultimate purpose. And so you can see Simon's response, verse, verse 11, as he finishes, they, they, they pulled their boats up on the shore, left everything, and followed him. I mean, when it says they left everything, that includes two boats left worth of fish. They'd never had a catch like it. But he, he doesn't want the things that Jesus could get for him anymore. He just wants Jesus himself. The day started with him packing away his empty nets. It ends with him heading off on the adventure of a lifetime. So here's, here's a thought for us as, as, as this applies into our lives. As we encounter Jesus in this written record, we are encountering the living God who steps into our world and invites us to leave our own empty nets and join him in his ultimate purpose for us and the world. I think we know what I mean, by the way, when I say leave our empty nets. In the midst of all life's busy what questions, what are we going to get the kids for tea, what are we going to do for summer holiday, what, 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 at some level most of us are searching for some kind of deeper purpose, an ultimate why. Okay, we look for it in our jobs, some kind of deeper purpose to my life, and we may enjoy our work, but there's no ultimate purpose there. So it's as if we come back with empty nets. Now we look for purpose in our relationships, and there is so much that is good in our relationships, but there's also so much that disappoints. And if we're looking for that as a place of ultimate purpose, again, all we have is empty nets. We look for lasting purpose through our kids, but they grow up so fast and then they're gone, and life keeps ticking to its inevitable conclusion, and again, we we just have empty nets if that's where we're looking for ultimate purpose. You see, for ultimate purpose, we need to encounter a, 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 a reality bigger than us and his bigger purposes for our world. And, and that's the good news of Jesus. He says, friends, there is a purpose, there's a plan. It centers on Jesus and he is calling you into that yourself. And when the, the, the little what's of your life cohere with the big why that he gives us through Jesus, well, everything begins to fit into place. Like Simon, of course, we're all, we're all sinful people, but Jesus comes with grace and mercy to forgive us. Like Simon, you might consider yourself unreligious or, or not really a kind of church person. But that's irrelevant. We're not talking about religion here. We're talking about reality. The God who is there, who calls us into the real purpose uh, for life. That we might flourish a life of abundance with him. There was a lovely um, video over the Jubilee weekend of, did you see this one? It kind of went semi-viral, I think. The Royal Protection Officer, Dick Griffin. And um, he is there and he's reminiscing about a time when he was up in Balmoral with the Queen and they went for a picnic, kind of locally, to the, to the castle. 
And um, normally it's very, very quiet, but on one occasion, he, he reminisced, some American tourists came along. And um, there they were, having their picnic, and the conversation went something um, like this. Oh, hello, do you live nearby? And D Dick Dick says it became pretty clear that they had not recognised who the Queen was. And the Queen replied saying, oh yes, uh, just, uh, just they've got, got, got a, um, well I live in London, but I've got a holiday house just, uh, just over the hills. And um, they said, oh, how lovely, how, how long have you been coming here? And the Queen said, well, about 60 years or so. And, um, and uh, the American tourists then say, oh, well, I, I, given you've been coming here so long, I suppose you, you might have met the Queen. <laughs> and apparently, quick as a flash, the Queen said, well, no, I haven't, but uh, Dick here has. <laughs> and, so, um, and so the American tourists then give the Queen their camera and ask for a, uh, for a picture with them and Dick. And uh, eventually they, they, they managed to get a picture of the Queen. She, they, they, they never let on in the, the entire encounter. And apparently the Queen, uh, as, they, as they walked off, the Queen turned to Dick and said, I'd love to be a fly on the wall when they show their holiday pictures to their family and friends. It's classic, isn't it? It's one of the many reasons that we can't help but love the Queen. Well, listen, one of the reasons that Luke has written his account of the life of Jesus is that he doesn't want us to make the same mistake with Jesus. Okay, we live in a culture that has high levels of familiarity with Jesus. Okay, with churches in every town, we celebrate his birth every Christmas. Okay, most people have heard of Jesus one way or another. But it's possible to have high levels of familiarity with Jesus and totally miss who he is. So as we close, just a couple of questions for us. First, have you recognised Jesus? Okay, put yourself in the position of those two American tourists, but with Jesus, have you recognised him? Um, if you're new to Christian things, by the way, that, that's going to take a little bit of time. It, it would help to take the gospel away, have a read, just discover it for yourself. Okay, come along on Sundays, listen, think, engage. Get to know other Christians, ask them about their faith, what led them to follow Jesus, what persuaded them. Be humble and open to discovering something new and wonderful in Jesus that perhaps you haven't noticed before. Okay, so ha have you recognised Jesus? And then secondly, have you responded to Jesus? Okay, it begins with a humble admission. Those words of Simon, I'm a sinful man. I don't deserve this. I need mercy. Followed by a joyful commitment. Jesus, I will follow you, leaving the empty nets and following after him. And it ends with a life of lasting purpose. Okay, whether you're at work or at home, or whether you're with your friends or your family, you know the one who made you, who loves you, who has a good purpose for the world and who has brought you into that. There's no better lasting purpose than that. So as we close, let me, let me invite us all just to have a few moments of quiet reflection, maybe around those two questions. And then I'll, uh, I'll lead us in a prayer. good news of Jesus. And for any friends here today who are not at a point of saying, yes, I recognise Jesus as God stepped into our world and coming to call us to this, this bigger purpose. And pray, pray for these, these, these friends, Lord, and we pray that you'd help them to begin this, this journey of discovery, um, the deeper purpose that you have for our world and how they fit into it. For anyone who has recognised Jesus but simply hasn't really responded yet to his call, not really living as if he was the king of the universe. And we pray for these uh, friends as well and, and ask that you would help them to do as Simon did and leave the empty nets and uh, follow after Jesus in every area of their lives. And we 
thank you that you call us, Lord Jesus, into a life of flourishing and abundance. And even when there is a cost to following you, ultimately your purposes for us are good. And so we pray these things now for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. We're going to have a chance to reflect a bit further. It's a song for us just to listen to rather than to sing along to. So I'll hand it to the musicians um, and we can listen in. Of, of strife across the world. 
And we pray especially for those who are fleeing and uh, finding refuge in our country. We pray that you'd help us to be um, good hosts and hospitable for those who are in our midst. Loving Father, we continue to pray for those who lead us. We pray for the government as they seek to, um, to lead. Father, we pray that you help them to do so with integrity, where there's a, a growing crisis of confidence in the integrity of our politicians. We pray that you'd restore trust and that you'd help those who, who lead to do so with wisdom. We continue to pray for our Queen in the, in the aftermath of her Latin celebrations, and we pray that you'd be strengthening her faith day by day and helping her to make the most of every opportunity to, um, to witness to, to you and to rule with, um, uh, with your grace and mercy. Heavenly Father, we pray for uh, Bobby and Libby, we praise you for them, for Peter and Wiz, we, we pray that you'd be with them as they seek to raise them in the knowledge and fear of the Lord. And we pray that um, they would grow up to be um, uh, to be confident um, in your great love for them. And finally, Father, we pray for those um, uh, coming for um, adults, for adults coming for baptism for our baptism service next week. We pray for uh, for David. Uh, we pray for Steph. We pray for Emily. And we pray for Noah. We pray, Lord, that your love would be surrounding. These people as they come to um, uh, uh, pledge their allegiance to you in baptism next week. We pray that be a wonderful celebration um, for us all as we celebrate your new life. And we pray all of these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. And we finish uh, by praying together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. As we um, come to the end of our service, we join together in the wonderful words of the hymn, And Can It Be? Let us really rejoice in what our loving God has done for us. So let us stand and sing together.